All right, folks, I'm here with a special guest. Many of you may know Carolyn Peck from ESPN, watching all of her coverage over the years. But more importantly, she is the first African-American woman to win a Women's Division I National Basketball Championship. Carolyn, thank you for joining us. And we are here between the WNBA Finals games, Game 3 and Game 4. Now, Carolyn, first, just what's your thoughts just on this exciting WNBA Finals matchup? Well, this is what everybody wanted, right? Mm -hmm. The two, what they call, quote, super teams. And these two teams we saw Las Vegas play two of their best basketball in the first two games, and then New York brought it in game three. Mm -hmm. So I think we're in for a real treat with game four. For sure, for sure. I'm really excited about it. Just what's your thoughts, just how the atmosphere has been so far in Brooklyn and then in Las Vegas first? Well, starting out in Las Vegas, I mean, you had the stars came out. LeBron James was there. Uh, Lil Kim is performed here mm -hmm. in New York, in the Barclays. Yep. So, like everybody, you're entertained mm -hmm. not only on the court but even in the breaks as well. Mm -hmm. So, and when I looked up the rafters in the Barclay, normally that's draped during the regular season. Drapes were gone, and people were up there yep. with the rally with the rally towels. Yep, it's a packed house. All right, sold out last game and game four. Expecting the same with the Liberty having a chance to tie the series up. I haven't heard Stephen A. Smith this morning on his show talking about how he had to be here tomorrow night sitting courtside. So it's going to be exciting. He didn't want to be outdone by Robin Roberts. <laughs> yep, yep, you're right about that. <laughs> now, now I know, okay, now when you were coming up, you're from Tennessee, right? I am. Okay, you're from Tennessee. Now, just how old was it you just coming up as a kid and playing basketball? How did you get into basketball? Well, I grew up about 35 minutes from the University of Tennessee where Pad Summit mm -hmm. had women's basketball on the mountain. Uh, I've got two brothers, one that's five years older than me, and watching him play made me want to play. Mm -hmm. And so when he would go play pickup, he started dragging me along, and at first I was just shooting on the side, and then I was like, how can I get in? Because, you know, it's guys playing. Mm -hmm. And they eventually let me play, and it was just something that I saw could be a pathway to college. And But my parents were like, you're not playing basketball if you don't get the grades, right? Mm -hmm. And so went on to college, got a, a scholarship to go to Vanderbilt. And then from there, I played professionally in Italy and Japan. And then started coaching with Pat Summit at Tennessee and went on from there. Right, now I know you went to Vanderbilt and SEC. Just real quick, how was your time playing at Vanderbilt? Oh, it was good. We were the, my class was the first class that was able to get Vanderbilt into the NCAA tournament. Nice, okay. So we kind of broke the ground, mm -hmm. felt like trailblazers mm -hmm. there. Uh, but the experience was great. I got a great education, mm -hmm. played against some great talent. A lot of women that mm -hmm. went on to play in the Olympics. I remember playing at Georgia and played against um, Teresa Edwards, mm -hmm. Katrina McClain, mm -hmm. and Vicki Orr that mm -hmm. was at Auburn. Mm -hmm. I mean, there were a lot of greats uh -huh. that played back in my time. Mm -hmm. And when you were playing when you finished at Vanderbilt, there was no WNBA yet, and so if you wanted to play professional, you had to go overseas. And so, I know, so that I'm, I'm sure you were probably torn about what to do, whether go overseas play basketball or get a job not playing basketball in the state. So, how was that for you? Well, I got a job right out of college because mm -hmm. I decided after after college I wanted to go into the corporate world. Mm -hmm. So I actually worked for a television station, but I was selling television advertising. I did that for a year. Then I sold pharmaceuticals for two years, but I really missed the game. And any free time I had, I was still working out. I was still training. And so my agent, original agent I had out of college, signed me and said, if I can find you a place to play, do you wanna go? So I actually got to go to Italy on personal paid leave from my pharmaceutical company. So I was getting two checks, so that was great. So I did a year in Italy and then spent two more seasons playing in Japan. Okay, and I know eventually you ended back you ended at Tennessee on the coaching staff with Pat Summit, who you talked about how growing up you were close to their campus and all that. So how did you end up on Pat Summit's coaching staff? Well, I after playing in Japan, I came back and I was playing. I was at a USA Basketball trial. I was just watching with friends of mine there, and uh, Mickey DeMoss, who is an assistant for Pat, came over and was like, "What are you doing now that you know you're not playing overseas?" And I said, "Well, I hadn't really thought." that through yet I don't know and she said you thought about coaching so I said yeah I thought about it I worked camps in the off season so she said uh, Pat may have an opening two days later Pat called me and said I got a camp going on you want to come work for a couple of days a couple of weeks and see if it's a fit and it was it was a perfect fit with 
with Pat, with Mickey DeMoss, and Holly Warlick was on the staff as well, and we just clicked. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Pat offered me the job. I still have the letter that she hand wrote me, welcoming me to Tennessee. And you know, there was there was no better place to start your coaching career mm -hmm. than learning under the great of Pat Summit. Right, and I know that one of those years you were there in '95 when UConn beat Tennessee, and Rebecca Lobo, another legend, one of your colleagues, was started that Connecticut team. And okay, so I know that you ended up, you went to Kentucky for a little bit, and then you got the job, had the coaching job at University of Purdue, where you had so much success there. And so I'm gonna tell everybody, so I believe your second year, you all won a championship, 1999, and you were the first black woman, like I said, to win a women's division one basketball championship. Also though, you were the youngest woman period to win a championship. And first, not only the first title in Purdue history for women, but the first title ever in the Big Ten Conference for women's basketball. So all that was just an incredible achievement. So just how was that moment for you being, being able to do that? Well, it was uh, when you're in the grind and mm -hmm. <laughs> you're chasing it, it's all about your players and your staff, and you really don't think about the accomplishment. Purdue brought us back for the 10-year anniversary, and that's where we really got to celebrate and really look at what we've done. Mm -hmm. And you know, to be the youngest, to be the first African-American woman, but we're still the only Big Ten championship mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that, right. you know, Purdue has the only Big Ten yeah. championship in the Big Ten. Yeah. That's I mean, that's, that's something that our women that really, they hold on to that. Mm -hmm. And if someone else does it, that'll be great. But to be the first mm -hmm. is something that these women will always be able to claim. For sure. Okay. About a couple more for you. I appreciate your time. Now, I know you got a chance early in WNBA's history to coach there as well. So, and now, you know, when the league first started, was starting. How was that experience for you to be able to coach in the WNBA very early on in its uh, development? Yeah, well, I was able to watch because I was coaching at Purdue mm -hmm. um, in 97 when it mm -hmm. first kicked off. Mm -hmm. uh, and then that the 90, the 96 Olympic team mm -hmm. did what yeah. they did and went in the gold medal. And watching, I thought, this is going to be something special. And mm -hmm. Coach John Lucas, I was able to meet him mm -hmm. when I was coaching at Tennessee and wow. come in to visit Pat. Mm -hmm. He asked me where did I want to be and see myself in the next 10 years. And I had said I want to be the first female on an NBA staff mm -hmm. because at the time there was no WNBA. Mm -hmm. And after my first year at Purdue, uh, Pat Williams, mm -hmm. that was yeah. vice president of the Orlando Magic, called me and said, would you be interested in starting our franchise? And I was the GM and the head coach. You know, looking back, I'm like, was I crazy? Because <laughs> it wasn't just the GM of getting players. It was GM of right. building a business model. Yeah, right, right. So we Which had to do ticket sales. Yeah, we had to do yeah, community yeah, yeah, relations. Yeah. We had to do... You know, figure out budgets and yeah. where everybody's going to play. I had to hire a whole crew. Mm -hmm. So it was like getting my masters in yeah. business, being yeah. able to start that off. But it was a lot of fun. That's the team now that's the Connecticut Sun. Right. Awesome. Okay. You know, that's very interesting that you said that because a lot of people, they hear people who aren't in the sports or whatever, they hear general manager and they think, oh, they're, they're running the whole business, but they're really just getting the players. But for you, you really were running the whole organization mm -hmm. and everything that went into it. Wow, that's very interesting. Yeah. WNBA. Okay, so what do you think, Jess, you know, from when you were playing to early WNBA years to now, like, do you see a progression at all with the talents of the women and with the league in the 27 years? Oh, my gosh. The talent has just exploded. And you have to give credit to those original players that became mm -hmm. role models mm -hmm. for these women mm -hmm. that are now grown mm -hmm. and playing in sure. the WNBA. And I was thinking like, on Sunday when we were doing the game, doing the countdown, I remember when I was a GM, we were having to give tickets away mm -hmm. to get people in the seats. Mm -hmm. This is sold out here at Barclays. Mm -hmm. And uh, Kathy Engelbert said, this is probably the the biggest ticket revenue, revenue generating event that happened on Sunday. Mm -hmm. People are paying money, that big money, big to get up. prime seats mm -hmm. here to see these WNBA finals. Mm -hmm. Gucci Row in Vegas, same thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I... I the president, Nikki Fargus, had told me she was having to turn away celebrities that were calling trying to get tickets just because there were no seats available. Well, I'm lucky I got my credential. I'll be in here. And uh, let me really quick about the series. So now the series, the interesting thing about these two teams, you know, they're both powerhouses coming in. Everyone thought they would be here. And during the regular season, you know, 3-2, Liberty Advantage. So here in the finals right now, so far, 2-1 Vegas. So eight games this year. Both won four games apiece. What's interesting is that in every game, 
The winner has won by double digits, except for August 28th, where it was a nine point Liberty win, so still a big margin. Do you have any idea why that's the case with these two teams? I, I don't think it's the point differenti differential that really matters. Mm -hmm. It is the production in the paint. Mm -hmm. In this whole series, the team who has won the paint has won the game. Mm -hmm. And it was a small margin in the paint mm -hmm. for game three, but New York won that. Mm -hmm. And I think that for Vegas to close things out, they're gonna have to keep New York out of the paint. For New York, as long as Courtney Vandersloot and Sabrina Ionescu are getting downhill and inside, that opens up the threes, but the Paul's got to get there first. So I think that that's where this game's going to be decided. How often will it get in the paint? Okay, enough said. All right, folks. Carolyn Peck, again, the first black woman to win a women's Division One basketball championship. There's only two, her and Dawn Staley. All right, so Carolyn Peck, thank you so much, and great meeting you. Thank you. We're back.